Whether it's a product for home or business, farm or factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. The Willow Cabin, scheduled for this evening, will be presented two weeks from tonight. This evening, Westinghouse Studio One presents Flowers from a Stranger. you in this wildcat mood. Oh, I don't want you to go. Oh, I want you to stay like this all day. It's spring. Snappy as though April were just waking up in silence. You really were frightened for a minute, weren't you? You're infuriating. You know everything. I'll never marry a psychiatrist again. Don't you do it. Now tell me, what were you frightened about? Oh, I don't know. Just a silly dream. I've had it before. I'm all alone, and I keep hearing this tune. And somehow it's terribly important for me to remember what it is, but I can't finish it. How does it go? Well, I don't know. You woke me up, and now it's gone forever. <laughs> What's today? Tuesday. Just Tuesday. Oh, what else? Oh, there must be something special about it, or else I wouldn't feel this way. I know. It's put the manure in the seed bed, Tuesday. Huh. Uh, Hand me my brush, will you? Margaret will be here any minute with the tray. Anyone for dinner tonight? Uh-huh. The Cameron. Oh, well, I forgot to bring in Marion Leroy with them. You remember that little brunette they had with them New Year's Eve? Oh, yes, the little brunette. Well, I might even come home and put on a dinner jacket for that. Don't be obvious, my love. You want to shock the local inhabitants? Hmm. There's room for an extra man if you want to bring someone from the hospital with you. All right, I'll see who's free. How about the great big visiting farmer you've been working with? Brunette? Oh, I doubt if he'd do it. He moves in a little too high a bracket for me. Well, there's no harm in trying, is there? No, it'd be very fine if he would. Maybe I will ask him. I'll make myself velvet and seductive for the occasion. Plunging neckline and long vans after. Oh, don't waste your strength. He has white hair and a list of letters after his name like a Washington bureau. And to top it off, he hates women. Oh, he does, does he? That sounds good and vulnerable to me. How old is he? Oh, 50 odd. He lost his wife when he was very young. He's had a rather rough time of it, I guess. From rags to Richard? No, but he spent four years in a Nazi concentration camp. He still has one crippled hand. Oh. He's been particularly nice to me so far. We're working on a couple of tough cases together, and it wouldn't hurt to have him keep on treating me that way. Well, I'll do my best. Well, I've got to run along. If Nestor says yes, I'll let you know. Well, you look much too seductive for this hour of the morning. You don't make it a bit easy for a man to walk out on you. But I didn't ask you to go. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Why? And just as well. Oh, you can. Come in, Margaret. Come right in. Good morning. Bye. I'll see you at seven. Good morning, Mrs. Baylor. Lovely morning, ain't it? Heavenly. Oh, uh, by the by, would it be your birthday or anniversary or something? Not that I know of. Why? Well, sure, someone's thinking of you this day. A fine box of flowers arrived just a half an hour ago. Flowers? Well, why didn't you bring them in? I thought it best to wait until the doctor had gone, ma'am. Are you working up a secret affair for me, Margaret? Well, I never take nothing for granted, ma'am. 
just a needle old woman. Bring the flowers here this minute. I have them right outside. No wonder you were suspicious. I never saw such a bonnet. I was thinking the same thing myself, ma'am. Let's open them up. I'm fascinated. No one sent me flowers since I was married. Now you might. Isn't that rain? No, I don't like our white carnations. But, Miss Baylor. I can't stand white carnations. Take them away quickly. Please. But don't you even want to see the cars? Yes. Who brought these flowers, Margaret? Well, the boy delivered them about a half hour ago. He just said they were for you. I see. Thank you, Mom. For Lorna, April 12th. April 12th. For Lorna, April 12th. Well, what does it mean? Who? Why April 12th? Back today, of course. And no one here knows. So long ago. No one here knew, Mother. No one would know that April 12th. Oh, it's must be Luke Cameron or someone being funny. It couldn't be Kim. He's never sent me a flower in his life. It must be. Oh, forget it. It's such a lovely day. you've seen part one of Flowers from a Stranger, let's turn to our Westinghouse program. Let's fall in love. <laughs> that sounds like a mighty good idea. Let's ask Betty Furness and her friend just how we do it. It's easy if you pick the right sweetheart. And we've done that, haven't we, Bill? Oh, you bet we have. And there it is. A sweetheart in any house. The brand new Westinghouse refrigerator that has everything. Let's take a real good look at it. There. The Westinghouse freeze chest holds 46 pounds of frozen food and ice at zero temperature. Keeps it safely, steadily frozen in Westinghouse colder cold. And gentlemen, look at this. The ice cube storage tray holds over 100 extra ice cubes. Altogether, this Westinghouse refrigerator has space for 59 pounds of frozen storage alone. Now, let me show where you keep the fresh meats that you don't want frozen. The bacon, the cold cuts, and other fresh meats go right in there. It holds 18 pounds and keeps meat fresh for days. Now, you can't get a meat keeper like this in any other refrigerator that has an all-across freeze chest. What's more, these spacious middle shelves hold lots of food. And see? The big humid drawer keeps your green things dewy fresh. Wouldn't you be proud to own this stunning Westinghouse refrigerator? Sure, and what about the price? Look, a big eight and a half cubic foot refrigerator with all those features for only $259.95. Ever hear of a price like that for all that refrigerator? You'll fall in love with a new Westinghouse refrigerator that gives you so much for such little cost. And you can own this refrigerator for as little as 35 cents a day. Come on in and see it. And now let's return to Westinghouse Studio One and flowers from a stranger. The front page of your report. Thank you, Mother. The front page of your report. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Baylor's office. No, I'm sorry, the doctor's been out in an emergency case all morning. No, I can't say when he'll be back. <laughs> I'll tell him you call, Doctor. Well, perhaps I should give it up. But I particularly wanted to speak to Dr. Bailey this morning. I can't believe that he'll be away much longer. He seldom stays away as long as this, Dr. Nestor. And I'm not in your way here. No, not a bit. 
Oh, good morning, Dr. Nestry. Oh, there you are, Dela. Have I kept you waiting long? No, not at all. I believe your nurse has some messages for you. Nothing urgent, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Higgins. Well, then, sir. Cigarette? With pleasure. I am particularly interested in the case of Mrs. Francesi. She's one of your patients. Oh, yes, I just left her, as a matter of fact. She's the one that's been giving me all the trouble this morning. Yes. I understand. Very unusual case. Really? There must be something that escaped me. She's in a manic state at the moment, of course, but... Yes, I understand, but what interests me is the patient's background in relation to her sister. She continues to wish to kill her sister for reasons that are far from clear to me. Furthermore, the ease with which she can be persuaded to transfer that impulse toward anyone else. That's rather unusual. I see she attempted on you one day. Well, more than once. She'd strangle a cat if she could get her fingers on it. It's a completely hopeless case, I'm afraid. No doubt, no doubt. But I have found that some such apparently hopeless cases do respond to hypnotism. You amaze me more every day, Doctor. Well, I had no idea you had any use for hypnotherapy. Use whatever tools come to hand. We might turn up some very interesting material. In any case, I should like to talk to the patient, if that is possible. Well, of course. I'll have to issue you a pass because of her being in the wing. Won't take a moment. Thank you. Higgins, take out a pass for Dr. Nestry to visit Mrs. Francesi in E-47. Bring it in. I'll sign it. Oh, by the way, Doctor, my wife and I wondered whether, by any chance, you'd be free to dine with us this evening. This evening? Why, yes, I believe I am free. And I should be delighted. Good. Lorna will be very pleased. Here's the pass, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Higgins. Is your pass, Doctor? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. running through my head all day long. Every time I try to concentrate, it disappears. Oh, forget it. <whistles> you know, if I were any sort of husband, I'd have brought you some flowers tonight. <laughs> so glad you didn't. Had all the flowers I can stand for one day. And what are you talking about? Oh, it's ridiculous, but somebody sent me two dozen white carnations this morning. Well, don't you know who it was? No, there was no name on the card. Unfortunately, I behaved very badly. I'm glad you weren't here. You would have been thoroughly ashamed of me. Why? And I screamed at Margaret. She was very hurt. Now, well, what was that about? Well, I can't stand white carnations. I have a phobia about them. I guess I got it from Dad. He always hated them. Said they had the odor of death. I can't help getting a feeling of panic inside when I look at the beastly thing. It's childish, I know. I'll remember that the next time I think of sending you flowers. Ah, uh, the first time, my love. You know, Sometime, I'm going to have to learn how a husband's supposed to behave. <laughs> I like the way you behave. Oh, my goodness. There they are. I haven't finished dressing. You go down and meet them. I won't be long. I'll rattle up a batch of cocktails. Where are we having them? On the terrace. Halfway in the drive. Why don't they move? Why should they leave their headlights on me? Oh, that silly they just stalled. Maybe they just turned in the wrong drive. There's no reason to feel there's anyone watching me. And yet, I can't help it. I feel he's watching me deliberately. He is watching me, he is. I was probably only testing you. They're always the last to arrive. It must have been. It must have been. Well, it can't be that interesting. It's only a martini. I was watching your hands. Why, what's wrong with them? Nothing. They're very good hands. Very sensitive. Are you going to tell me I should have been a musician? I can't even play top six. <laughs> Lorna has all the talent in that direction. I'm still looking at your hands. You should have been a surgeon, I think. Would you trust me to hack away at you? Yes. 
I think I would. Yes. Say, what are you two putting in those things? Our sponges are hanging out. Coming up. Marion's trying to turn me into a surgeon. Well, she'd better watch your carve of turkey first. She might change her mind. Oh, Dr. Bailey is too good a psychiatrist to waste his time. Why, oh, thank you. I do not like surgeons. I believe there are subtler ways of easing pain than by cutting the patient's throat. <laughs> well, cheers. Mm. Ah. Hey, where's Lorna? She's usually the prompt one. Here she is, and full of apologies. Hello, Ted. Hello. Hello. Lorna? Hello, Don't Lorna. marry him. Well, Lorna, this is Dr. Nestry, doctor of my wife. I've waited for the pleasure a long time. A long time? You make it sound like years and years. Well, I don't wonder you're surprised. But I heard of you long before I came to Swartham. Lorna Deschamps. That is not an unknown name to me. Deschamps? What is this, Lorna? A secret past you kept hidden from us? Well, don't look at me. I never heard the name. Where did it come from? I don't know. It's true, I played a few concerts in Europe under that name. My father didn't approve, so I had my name changed. In the end, he made me give up playing altogether. Do you mean you don't play anymore? Oh, no, I still play. But it's strictly non-professional now. <laughs> I'm very lazy about it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Kim, darling, Margaret has some appetizers. Would you get some, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm, yes. so good girl, Margaret. I was just coming for her. It's so good to see you, Marion. How long are you going to stay this Oh, time? I must get back next Monday, I'm afraid. I'd oh. love to stay here forever. I love this place. But a girl must eat, I'm afraid. <laughs> How's the world, Lou? Terrible. Mr. Cameron's our one source of information, Doctor. Oh, yes? He's the owner and editor of the local newspaper. Oh, I read a number of your editorials. They're very good, you know. Very good indeed. You Thank that. you. Lou used to work for the Times, but he got tired of life in a big city. So he came home to Roots about five years ago. Why? Lazy. Furthermore, in New York, I was just another newspaper man. Here, I'm a leading citizen. I'm uh, weak-minded enough to enjoy the adulation. <laughs> oh, no, I understand that. I understand it. Don't let Lou fool you. He's quite a crusader when he gets stirred up. Say, this little girl is getting chilly. Do you mind if we move inside? Yeah, go right ahead. Well, I'll take these along. Thank you, darling. Do you too feel cold, Mrs. Baylor? No. It reminds me of one of those wonderful cool evenings along the Adriatic. You are not American, are you? Only half. My mother was Chilean. I was raised abroad. You traveled a great deal then. Oh, yes, my childhood was very nomadic. My father was an art dealer. Took him to some of the most outrageous places and some very beautiful ones. Uh, what was your father's name? Trenton. Bruce Trenton. Oh, there's no reason for you to have known him. He was rather obscure. On the contrary, at one time he was extremely well known in Europe. As a matter of fact, I had some dealings with him myself. Of course, that was many years ago. <laughs> Fascinating. Here I was expecting a total stranger, and you know more about me than my own husband. You even know me under my most secret aliases. Oh, Lorna Deschamps. You know, I heard you play your first concert under that name in Cannes. Cannes? <laughs> but that was only a student's recital. I was oof, no more than 15. It's incredible of you to have remembered. Not incredible at all. You had an extraordinary talent, even then. I knew that sooner or later I should hear you play again. I haven't that much talent. It's enough to impress the citizens of Swadham. But I know the difference, and so do you. You'll play for me after dinner, though. If you like. Let's call it payment for my not being here to greet you. Oh, please don't apologize. The others were most cordial. They made me feel at home at once. Then uh, you were not the first one to arrive? No. The Camerons, I believe, arrived some time before me. And then my car stalled in the driveway. And I saw you at the upper window. And I said to myself, isn't this strange? There stands Lorna Deschamps. She knows nothing about me. I mean nothing to her. And yet I have known her for many years. Have in fact looked for her again and again. Have wondered what has happened to that strange, talented child whose music, for no reason I can explain, has haunted me for so long. What sort of a woman has that child grown to be? What? But I ramble on and you seem to be growing chilly. You do feel cold, do you not, Mrs. Baylor? Yes. Yes, I do. Shall we join the others? By all means. But after dinner, I shall hold you to your promise and make you play for me.
on is doing herself proud tonight. Jeffrey hasn't taken his eyes off of her all evening. Well, I guess I started it. I told her he wouldn't look at her. Oh. It just shows. You never know. You've got yourself married to quite a special woman. I suppose you know that. Well, how can I forget it? You remind me every time we meet. <laughs> Probably the reason why I never get anywhere with you. Uh, well, it's one of the reasons. <laughs> you know, if you were any kind of gentleman, you'd go and help her out now. Anyone care for a little more brandy? Here, that's a man's work. I was wrong, darling. You've impressed our guest of honor. Apparently. Think it'll help? Well, it can't hurt. No, I'm glad he has white hair. I might be getting jealous. You needn't. I don't really like him. Don't ask me why. <laughs> what are you going to play for us, Lana? I don't really want to, honestly, Mary, and I was hoping they'd all forget about it. Have you been composing anything lately? A little. Tried for a while this afternoon, but the silliest tune kept going through my head, and I just couldn't get rid of it. Something you think you ought to know? I think so. But it's as if it was strangely off-key or off-rhythm or something. I can't spot it to save my life. Can you hum it? Maybe I can help. No, I can't. Have you tried to play it on the piano, Mrs. Taylor? No. Why don't you try it? It might come to you. I don't know. I don't recognize it. Try it. Try it again. It's been a long time since Lorna played. Dr. Nestor, you must find our life here a little provincial. On the contrary, I find it most stimulating. You see, one never knows where a search may end. In Paris, Mexico, in Brazil, or in a little Pennsylvania town like Swarthen. Search for what? For each of us, there is a constant search for some, let me call it, inescapable connection. All of us, the normal and the abnormal alike, are driven toward an inexorable imperative, toward a goal which is all too seldom fearful. Then of a sudden we glimpse an unexpected vista and know, know with a kind of sick, illogical certainty, that that is our own peculiar destiny. This there may sometimes be one of peace, sometimes of futility, sometimes of change, and yes, even of terror. But for better or worse, we know that that is our own inescapable summation. We must accept it. This is the end of our quest. I'm sorry. I'm not feeling very well. I hope you'll all forgive me. I'd better lie down. Lorna, can I help no, you? No, please, I'd be all right. Good I'm so night. sorry. I hope it is nothing I have said or done, Mrs. Baylor. I'm most frightfully sorry. You should go to her at once, Doctor. She doesn't seem to be at all well. Excuse me. Sure. Lorna! Lorna! Lorna, speak to me. Lou. Yes? Get Dr. Cole at the hospital. Get him over here. Lorna. No, and I don't want to. It's thoroughly evil. Yes, it was evil. 
been lying here the last two days. I kept wondering, where did it come from? Have you any idea? Yes, partly. I feel more and more strongly that it was in some way connected with my mother's death. I was only five, so it's a little vague to me. Didn't your father ever talk to you about it? No, it was too painful to him. I only knew she jumped in front of a train. I wanted to ask him often, but I didn't dare. Were you with her? No. Are I'm... you sure? Wait, Sometimes. wait. I seem to remember standing on a long, crowded platform, waiting for a train to come in. And then, suddenly, somewhere quite close to us, someone began to whistle that little tune. And then... No, no, I can't. Oh, don't try. You've had enough for today. Just lie back and relax. We'll talk about it some more another time. Will I be allowed to go out tomorrow? For a little while. Two or seven, please. I don't care, Ma. I was just calling the operating room. I thought I might entice you into a nightcap before we went home. I could use it. How's Lorna coming along? Oh, she's much better the last few days. Been very busy in the garden. And that's probably Lorna now. Wondering why I'm not home. Hello. What? What? Mrs. Francesi. I'll be right down. What is it? Mrs. Francesi is missing. But that's impossible. I left Nesby with him not more than ten minutes ago. Well, he's not there now. Look, Fred, take a run down there, will you? See what you can do. I'll be along in a minute. Yeah, I sure. just want to call the house. Yes? Oh, yes, Dr. Baylor. I see. I see. Yes, I'll tell it. I'll do that. Yes, sir. Who well, was it, Martha? It was Dr. Baylor, ma'am. He's been held up at the hospital, and he wanted you to know so you wouldn't worry. Well, did he say when he'd be home? No, it seems one of the patients is missing, and he has to wait until they find her. Missing? You mean escaped? Yes, ma'am. Was she violent? He didn't say. He just wanted us to lock up and, and go to bed. Oh, you do look upset, ma'am. Would you like me to bring my things up and sleep in the room next to you? Yes. It's silly of me to be so nervous, but I would like it, Margaret. Well, you just run along, then, and I'll lock up. Check the windows. Be sure they're all closed. Yes, ma'am.
Layla. Quickly, it's an emergency. Kim! Kim, she's here! She's here, the insane woman. She tried to strangle Margaret. Come quickly, Kim. Yes. We need you. Let's pause for a moment and look at our program again. Come closer, sweetheart. Well, <laughs> say, I don't think that's fair, because we can't get closer. Oh, but you could. If you had one of the new Westinghouse television sets with the exclusive electronic magnifier that gives you a big close-up image whenever you want it. All you do is turn the electronic magnifier knob and there, you get the heart of the picture. And see, I'm close enough to say, hello, good looking. The electronic magnifier is controlled by this knob, and only a Westinghouse set has it. Now, let's suppose that you have this Westinghouse set in your home, and you're watching a dancer doing ballet poses, and she's so attractive that you decide you'd like to see her lots closer. Well, you just turn the electronic magnifier knob and presto. See how close she is now. So much closer. Turn the knob back when you want your standard Westinghouse picture again. Or switch it to the close-up position and the electronic magnifier enlarges the center of the action so that you get an image almost the same size as you get with a 16-inch tube. Now, this Westinghouse set also has a built-in antenna. In many localities, you save the cost of a roof installation. It also gives you Westinghouse synchro tuning. Now that means that when you tune in for the best sound, you don't get a so-called picture like this. Or when you tune in for the best picture, you don't get sound like this. Westinghouse synchro tuning tunes in the best picture and the best sound together automatically. And remember, Westinghouse is the only set that has all three. Synchro tuning, electronic magnifier, and a built-in antenna. Now, the set I have here costs only $249.95. And you can buy it on my small down payment plan. Stop in at any Westinghouse dealers and see Westinghouse television. Turn now to Flowers from a Stranger. Oh, all right, Margaret. But if you hadn't come in time, I don't think I could have handled her. Doctor would be here any minute now. Why did you come here? Why did you come here? Answer me. I hate you. I always hated you. I always wanted you to die. I hate you. She thinks you're a sister. She had the same idea about me at first. I know. How did you get in here? How did you get in here? He... He showed me the way. He knew. Who? Uh, he's my friend. You're not my friend. I hate you. I'd like to see you dead. And dead, too. You... No. Not you. You! No! Oh, that's him. Oh, Come in. Come in. Are you all right? I'll take it back to the
the hospital, Kim. You stay here with Lorna. Thanks, Fred. I'll file the report for you. Thanks. You've had quite a shock, Margaret. What you need is a good night's sleep. Yes, Margaret, you better get to bed. Well, I couldn't sleep a wink in that bed. If you don't mind, I'll go to my own room. Good night. Good, good night. night, Margaret. What's this window doing open? I don't know. I closed it myself. Well, the catch is broken. Somebody must have used a crowbar to pry this up. Look at these marks. Yes. I saw them. We'd better get you upstairs into bed, young lady. It's after three o'clock. No, not yet, Jim. What? I... Let's have it. Sit here by me, Kim, and try to listen. Is there something you haven't told me? Kim, that woman came here to kill me. She didn't come here by herself. She was brought here. That's a fascinating idea, Laura. Don't laugh at me, Kim. I know it's true. Lorna, it's almost morning. Can't we let it go? We've had a little sleep. No, if we can't talk about it now. Listen, Kim, I'm frightened. I'm really frightened. This thing isn't over simply because that woman's gone back to the hospital. It's just begun. All right, darling. I think I understand what you're trying to say. You're convinced someone brought that woman here to murder you. Yes. Well, who? Someone who knew that I slept upstairs and that Margaret <laughs> slept downstairs. Well, who would that be? Me? Fred? Don't laugh. Well, I'm sorry. Have you any other suggestions? Yes. I know who it is. Who? Dr. Nestry. Nestry? Lorna, have you any idea what you're saying? Your tone implies you don't think I'm quite sane. Well, aren't you being a little oversensitive about implication, Lorna? Perhaps. But I've known from the first night you walked into this house that there was something evil about him. But he wants to kill me. For what possible reason? I don't know. Oh, I realize you've had a shock. I realize oh, that. Oh, Kim, this has nothing to do with any shock. You have to believe that. Well, I'd like to, but it's too utterly fantastic. You've got to see that. I see that window standing open. After I closed and locked it myself, someone took an iron bar and pried it open. Listen to me, Kim. Suppose Margaret hadn't slept upstairs tonight. I would have been alone on that second floor. That woman would have found me there, not Margaret. She would have put her hands around my throat, not Margaret. I wouldn't have had the strength to fight her off. You'd never know what I'm telling you now. You weren't meant to know. You were meant to think it was an accident. But it wasn't an accident, it was murder! It just doesn't make sense. These things don't happen without any motive. Motive? Yes, I know. She wants something clear and logical. Well, I can't give you that, Kim. I can only feel it. Pressing closer and closer. I was asleep when Margaret screamed tonight. I've been dreaming. It's not very clear now, but... I know I saw my mother's body lying in the cinders in a station platform. In her hand, she held a single white carnation. Oh, Lorna, my dear. These things can be explained so easily. But it's not evidence. All right. You can't walk in. That's not evidence. But this is. I found this lying in front of the open window when I came down to call you. Dr. Nestry always wears a white carnation in his buttonhole. Oh, but this didn't come out of anyone's buttonhole. But look at the length of the stem. You're just trying to build up a case. It's a natural defense attitude. Oh, I see a good bit of it every day, in a more exaggerated form. Oh, Lorna, believe me. Please, don't treat me like a patient, Kim. That's all I ask. Well, I could take you away. We could... No! That's all I've ever done. Run away. Oh, Kim. Try to understand. Dad pretended that we were always on the move because he was an art dealer. That wasn't true. We were on the move because we were fugitives. The first time they asked me to play the piano in public, 
That almost went out of his mind. He made me dye my hair. He made me change my name. Secretly, I knew it was because I looked too much like my mother. He was in terror of my becoming famous as she'd been. We had no friends anywhere. He wouldn't permit it. He made an exception in your case for only one reason. He knew he only had a few days to live. There was someone he was mortally afraid of every moment of the time. I never knew who it was. He never spoke of it to me. But now I know. Oh, Kim. Kim, I can see it in your eyes. You don't believe any of it. You're just being tolerant. Professionally tolerant. Oh, Lorna. Oh, no, please. Go away. Let me alone. April 12th, April 12th, April 12th, April 12th, April 12th, April 12th. I love him so April much. April 12th. Need him April so much. 12th. But he can't April help me. April I must 12th. go. I April must 12th. go. April 12th, April 12th, April 12th. April 12th. April 12th. Operator. Operator. Oh, Dr. Baylor, I've been trying and trying to reach you. Well, what is it? It's Mrs. Baylor. She's gone. Gone? What do you mean? Well, after you left this morning, I heard the car starting up and drive off. I know. I left it for her. Said she had a lot of shopping to do. Yes, but she hasn't come back yet. And around 6 o'clock, I began to get worried. I called everywhere. No one had seen her. She wasn't at the stores or the Camerons. I tried to reach you, but Wait they said you were out. Hello? Hello, Lou? It's Kim. Look, Lou, could you come over here? Yeah, right away. No, I can't come over there. I haven't got a car. I'll explain when you get here. It's Lorna. I said it's Lorna. She's not here. She's... Sit down, Kim. Well, what's the next move? Sooner or later, we're going to have to notify the police. Let them try to find her. I suppose so. If only I'd known, but I thought. What difference does it make what I thought? What time is it? 9.30. Been gone 12 hours. Where? Where could she have gone? She has no family, no one to go to, no money. Maybe $20 in her pocket. A mystery. I keep trying to tell myself it's just a coincidence. But is it? Lou, do you really think that's it, do you? Wait a minute. Isn't that a car? Where have you been? I've been crazy. I drove into New York. You mind if I sit down? Terribly tired. Glad you're here, Lou. I almost asked you to go with me today. I wish you had. Well, I decided I had to do it alone. Do what? Prove to myself, if to no one else, that I wasn't out of my mind. But nothing I said made any impression. I had to get some proof. Of what, Lorna? Proof that my mother did not commit suicide. That she was killed. But, Lorna, that was 22 years ago. That's where I thought you might help, Lou. You see, my mother was quite famous before she married Dad. As Maria Serrano, she was known all over Europe. I thought there must be something in the papers at the time of her death. Well, I didn't know exactly what, but I had to try. Did you find anything? Yes. This was in the Times of April the 13th, 1928, the day after her death. I copied the two paragraphs. Read it, Lou. At the time of the accident, Miss Serrano, Mrs. Trenton, was on her way to New York with her daughter, Lorna, aged five. You were with her then? Yes, I was. Read the next one. Prior to her marriage to Mr. Trenton, Mrs. Trenton had been for a brief period the wife of Dr. Jean Nestre.
well-known European psychiatry. The marriage took place in Milan, Italy in April 1919. They were divorced in July 1920. Her marriage to Mr. Trenton took place a few months later in Baltimore, Maryland. Another tiny note here. Arrival, April 7th, 1928, Ponte de Savoy, out of Naples. Dr. Jean Nesco. Just a few days before death. Oh, what a bloody fool I've been. What a fool. Oh, if you're convinced, Kim, it's been worth it. What more proof could anyone need? Well, I didn't want to call the police before, but... Now, wait a minute, Kim. This isn't clear sailing by a long shot. Why not? Because in the eyes of the law, we have no case. All this stuff is strictly circumstantial. We'd have no chance whatever with the police. Unless... Unless what? We got a confession out of it. Well, why should he confess? If that's what we have to have, we're licked. Oh, but what can we do, Lou? This is the first thing I can think of. You and I might go see him, Kim. I have an idea that if we threw all this at him, we might get some. Why should you get involved, Lou? You can't go alone. I suggest you call him up right now. See if he's back. We might be able to see him tonight. Well, it's worth a try. I'll call the hospital first. Good. Hello. Hello, this is Dr. Baylor. Is Dr. Nestry there? What? Oh, he has. Thanks. Well? He left for home five minutes ago. Where is that? Seven miles out the Bristol Road. That ought to take us about 20 minutes. Well, we better get going. You take care of yourself. Yes, darling. leaving, ma'am. Yes, Margaret. Dr. Baylor went with him. I won't need anything else tonight, Margaret. Just take this. You can go to bed. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Night. I haven't startled you, Mrs. Baylor. The door was open and... I came to see your husband. You wanted to see him? Yes. Did you have a successful trip to New York, Mrs. Baylor? How did you know where I'd been? Purely accidental. I happened to follow you most of the way. My, my husband just went over to the camera for a minute. I'm sure I could... Please don't bother. I consider it most fortunate to have these few moments alone with you. You were aware, I think, the first time we met, that some peculiar, shall we say, force had brought us together. You did feel it, didn't you? Yes. It is as though I had hunted for you for many years. As though I had always known that somewhere you were waiting. You see, a long time ago, I knew someone very like you. Very delicate, very strange, very lovely. We had so short a time together. And then she died. She died? Yes, but did she? Did she? I've never felt sure that she'd really been completely destroyed. I've always felt as if some part of her remained somewhere, alive. 
warm and vibrant, taunting me, taunting me. You have eyes very much like hers. The same kind of hair. The same delicate fingers. I watched them the first time you played for me here. Strong fingers. You were struggling with that piece of music you could not remember. You were frightened by it, I could see. She was frightened by it once, too. I had hoped to hear you play for me at least once again. Would you? If you like. What do you want me to play? I'd rather have you choose. Yes, that's it. Play that at your first concert. Were you aware of that? No. You were a beautiful child then. You're now a beautiful woman. Thinking of you after that first evening, I found myself saying your name over and over. Maria. Maria. Oh. It's as though it were all before us again. You belong to me. To me alone. Say it. No. Say it. No. No. Say I am the only one you will ever love. Say it. Say it. You? You are not Maria. You are someone else. I know. You tricked me. You are his daughter. Her face, her body over his heart, his daughter. You thought you could make me forget, didn't you? You thought I'd forgotten what I came to do no. here. No, I know you've not forgotten, but why here? There'd be less suspicion if you threw my body under the wheels of a train. You know? How did you know? I was there. I saw you. No one saw me. No one. I saw you. I've known. Always. You killed her. You killed the one person you ever loved. You killed her. Didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you? Yes! I killed her. I didn't mean to. But I could no longer look into her eyes. Those eyes that had once been filled with fire and laughter were cold and empty of feeling. Slow, dead eyes that had lost their youth, that were soiled and full of sloth. I closed those eyes forever. They were not the eyes of the girl I loved. They were not Maria's eyes. So you killed her. And you don't dare look at me. Because when you do, you see the body of the woman you crushed under the wheels of a train. But are you sure she ever died? You see? You aren't sure. Even now. When you held me in your arms, were you quite sure Maria Serrano was dead? No. Do you want to kill the same woman twice? No. Come. No. Touch the cold of no. death what was life. No. Touch it. No. Then you know you're no. really mad. No, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. 
to remind you that the 1950 American Heart Association drive is open. And we're asking you to open your heart and give to this terribly important cause. Of the six leading causes of death today, heart disease is America's number one killer. Diseases of the heart and blood vessels cause more deaths than all other five combined. Now, doctors are working ceaselessly to try to find the real causes of heart disease and to educate us all about how to prevent it. But they need your help. Now, you may be helping your neighbor, someone in your own family, perhaps your child, or even yourself, when you give to the 1950 Heart Fund. Now, you can make your contribution just like that wherever you see the red plastic heart, or send it to heart, H-E-A-R-T, in care of your local post office. That's H-E-A-R-T, in care of your local post office. I'm sure that you're going to want to help fight this greatest threat to the health of all of us today. <laughs> in the cast of Flowers from a Stranger were Phil Arthur, Joseph Boland, Virginia Dwyer, Catherine Grill, Lois Nettleton, Ethel Everett, and Catherine Meskill. This is Paul Brenton saying goodnight for Westinghouse, inviting you to be with us again next week. Meanwhile, be sure to see the Westinghouse refrigerator that has everything at such modest cost. And the Westinghouse television set with the wonderful electronic magnifier. And now, until next week, good night.